Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Sullivan, and I'm the chair of the AAAR Endowment Committee. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our the tenth in our monthly series of AST lectures. This is a new initiative for AAAR, being supported by the Freelander Memorial Fund. So, with this, um, with these lectures, we hope to be able to give an opportunity to highlight the amazing research happening in our community, give us an opportunity to all come together outside of the annual conference and also to tie our journal to other activities. So each month, a high impact paper is selected by the editors of AST to be presented by its author. These lectures are being recorded and you can later um, watch them on YouTube, on AAAR's new YouTube channel, which you can access through the AAAR's website under the events tab. In addition, each month, one of AAAR student chapters is serving as host. And so I want to thank everyone who's helped to make all of these lectures happen and also all of you for joining us. And so with that, I'll turn it over to the, our student chapter from the University of California, Riverside to get us started. Thanks. For everyone for coming this morning and good morning from those of us here in California. Uh, our speaker today is Erin Katz. She's a second year PhD candidate in Professor Alan Goldstein's research group at the University of California, Berkeley, studying the sources and chemistry of urban volatile organic compounds. She received her BS in chemistry from Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, while at Drexel, she was in Professor Peter DiCarlo's research group and participated in field and laboratory experiments involving aerosol mass spectrometry. In this talk today, she'll be discussing the potential implications of her observations for studying ambient particulate matter with the AMS instrument. Um, as we go through the talk, feel free to send any questions in the chat. Otherwise, you'll have the opportunity to ask them directly at the end of Aaron's talk. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Erin. Cool, thank you so much for the introduction. All right, and we're seeing the right presentation, I assume, not the presenter view. Um, okay, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really exciting to be here um, on Zoom with you all to present the work that we published in ASNT last year on the quantification of organic aerosol using aerodyne aerosol mass spectrometers, um, specifically cooking organic aerosol in indoor environments. Um, I'd like to thank and acknowledge all of my co-authors, of course. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank the Jimenez Group at CU Boulder for iterating with me numerous times on the paper and providing their expertise on the topic. Um, I'd also like to thank my undergrad advisor, Peter DiCarlo, for believing in me and sending me to work on such cool projects um, as an undergrad. And thanks to the entire Home Chem team. I'll be sharing results from this field campaign uh, today. Thanks, uh, Marina Vance and Delphine Farmer for uh, running the project. And thank you to the Sloan Foundation for funding. I'm going to do a laser pointer. Yeah, OK. So I'd just like to start off by acknowledging and appreciating that studying organic aerosol is an analytical challenge. And this figure here describes a few of the approaches for studying organic aerosol in this space where the y-axis is completeness or the percent of mass analyzed, and the x-axis is chemical resolution. I'll point out uh, just two instruments on this, but first mention that a perfect instrument, which doesn't exist, would be able to analyze 100% of the mass with um, full molecular identification at very fast time resolution. One instrument that's really popular in my current lab is two-dimensional gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Whoa. 
<laughs> somebody's drawing on the screen. Okay, so this figure, uh, thanks to my lab mate, Emily Franklin, for providing this. Um, here we show all of the different molecules present in organic aerosol in the space where polarity is on the y-axis and volatility is on the x-axis. And each individual blob here represents a different molecule present in the organic aerosol. And in this figure, levoglucosan is indicated here, which is a known tracer for biomass burning. Another approach is um, AMS or aerosol mass spectrometry, which analyzes um, nearly all of the mass, but can only lump the organic aerosol into a few different chemical classes. And one example, let's see. I don't know why it's not advancing. Okay, there we go. Um, one example shown here um, from Shah et al. shows a few different AMS organic aerosol factors. So here we have signal on the y-axis and mass to charge on the x-axis, where each individual stick represents a ion fragment and it's colored by its ion type. And in this example, organic aerosol was separated into three different components, hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol, cooking organic aerosol, and an oxidized organic aerosol. So this is just one example of the few different chemical classes that AMSs can separate into. And I think before we keep going, I'm going to remove these red lines on the screen. Clear all drawings. Okay, cool. All right, sorry. So and aerodyne aerosol mass spectrometers or AMSs have become really popular and have really improved our understanding of ambient submicron aerosol composition across the world. And this figure shows um, a few different AMS measurements carried out at different field campaigns, and each pie chart represents the fractional contribution to total aerosol mass from sulfate, nitrate, ammonium, chloride, and then a few different classes of organic aerosol, in particular hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol, which is a primary species, and a few different oxidized organic aerosol, which are a secondary species. Um, so this figure really demonstrates how the AMS is able to describe aerosol composition with decent chemical complexity in, in pretty diverse environments. And it also highlights the dominance of organic aerosol across the world. So the green fraction of these pie charts is pretty significant. So the aerosol mass spectrometer works by continuously sampling air. Um, aerosols are focused to a narrow beam using an aerodynamic lens. Uh, the particle beam impacts a tungsten vaporizer set to 600 degrees Celsius. Um, and then the vaporized aerosols are ionized in the gas phase by 70 electron volt ionization. This leads to small ion fragments, and we typically don't analyze parent molecules uh, using this instrument. The small ion fragments are extracted and analyzed by a time of flight mass spectrometer seen here. Species are uh, able to be quantified using the AMS. Uh, those species that vaporize in a few seconds at 600 degrees Celsius can be quantified, and those include organics, sulfate, nitrate, ammonium, and chloride. And I'll also mention that the aerodynamic lens is most efficient at focusing particles between about 60 and 1,000 nanometers in diameter. Here's an example mass spectrum from the AMS. We have signal on the y-axis and mass to charge on the x-axis with each ion fragment uh, represented by a stick colored by its chemical class. We can sum each of the chemical classes that we're interested in and plot their concentration as a function of time. So here's some data that I collected in Austin, Texas during the home chem campaign. And you can see that, uh, for example, the organic aerosol peaks in the middle of the day, um, probably because of secondary production. And then down here at the bottom, uh, I'm also showing a size distribution, which we can calculate with the AMS, which shows the mass versus um, aerosol size. And the way that we calculate size distributions is by modulating the particle beam with this chopper here and calculating the aerosol's time of flight through this region as a function of its particle size. So as I mentioned, that uh, combined vaporization and fragmentation leads to small ion fragments in the AMS, so we don't analyze parent molecules. However, this fragmentation of the organic aerosol components leads to characteristic spectra, which we can link to sources. 
and positive matrix factorization or PMF is really commonly used in the AMS community to separate the organic aerosol mass spectrum into its discrete components. And those components are physically meaningful and can be linked to their sources. For example, I'm showing the different components of ambient organic aerosol in Barcelona, Spain from this uh, Moore et al. study published in 2012. They separated their organic aerosol into the five factors shown here, um, biomass burning organic aerosol, hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol, which I mentioned is a primary source typically um, emitted by vehicles, cooking organic aerosol, and then two oxidized organic aerosols. And again, these are characterized by their primary and secondary components. So the focus of this presentation is cooking organic aerosol. So it's important to mention that uh, cooking organic aerosol on average comprises about five to 20% of the urban submicron aerosol mass concentration. Here is an example of a COA mass spectrum collected in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Again, our signal on the y-axis and mass to charge on the x-axis. Um, another factor collected in Paris, France, and then Pasadena, California. And what I'd like to point out in each of these spectra is that the mass 55 to 57 ratio is greater than one. And that is commonly used to identify cooking organic aerosol in ambient data sets. However, um, cooking organic aerosol has been pretty difficult to separate um, from other primary components of ambient organic aerosol, um, specifically hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol because of their spectral similarity. Um, studies that have successfully identified cooking organic aerosol have usually been close to a strong source. So for example, this study conducted in Oakland, California shows a high fraction of primary organic aerosol in downtown Oakland, um, which they attribute to the high concentration of restaurants there. So indoors cooking, on the other hand, is a very major source of indoor aerosol concentration. Um, cooking emissions can comprise 80 to 95% of the total PM 2.5 concentration during indoor cooking events. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here by showing some home chem data, but here in this figure, figure we're showing the particulate matter mass concentration as a function of time for a few different cooking experiments that were conducted during the study. And what I'd like to point out is that the PM 2.5 concentration goes just from a few micrograms per meter cubed during background conditions up to a maximum of a few hundred micrograms per meter cubed during cooking events. And really common components of cooking organic aerosol include oleic acid, stearic acid, so these fatty acids, as well as glycerides, sugars, and anhydrous sugars. So we brought the AMS indoors during the Home Chem campaign in June 2018. The acronym stands for the House Observations of Microbial and Environmental Chemistry. The study took place at the U Test House in Austin, Texas. And uh, during this campaign, we conducted a number of experiments aimed at replicating indoor activities such as cooking and cleaning. And you can see here the U Test House kitchen pictured here with a number of instruments installed. Um, but we had all of our other instruments, including the AMS, in a trailers adjacent to the house with inlets to the kitchen, uh, which you can see kind of here in the corner. The other study which I'll be talking about today, um, which also brought the AMS indoors, was the Athletic Center Study of Indoor Chemistry, uh, which took place at the CU Boulder Athletic Center. And the main purpose of this study was to sample human emissions at the athletic center. However, um, cooking organic aerosol was brought to the sampling location via the HBIC ducts, which is why uh, we'll be talking about the athletic study today. So you can see here, there's a ton of instruments uh, pictured. This is the Home Chem Aerosol Instrument Trailer. The AMS is back here in the corner behind Matson. Uh, the Home Chem Kitchen had a number of instruments and uh, Athletic, there was also so many instruments. And this was really fun because we were able to compare um, every week and see whose instrument was right and whose was wrong. Um, it was kind of funny, every week I would text the Home Chem group chat and say things like, wow, like." I can't believe there's a milligram per meter cubed of organic aerosol right now during this bread toasting event. But then we'd get to the science meetings and compare and we found out that the AMS was consist consistently measuring much more aerosol than the other instruments that were on the field campaign. 
And uh, we, you know, talked with the athletic folks and we found out that they were seeing the same discrepancy with their AMS with those cooking plumes. So this inspired us to take a really deep dive into quantification and write this paper. So just to call out a few of the co-located instruments at home chem that we're comparing to for this study. Um, first is the SMPS or scanning mobility particle sizer, which analyzed aerosols between 15 and 660 nanometers, which were operated by the Jimenez and Vance groups. Uh, a scanning electrical mobility spectrometer, which analyzed aerosols between 10 and 1000 nanometers, operated by the Hildebrand Ruiz group and um, an ultra high sensitivity aerosol spectrometer measured between 60 and 1000 nanometers operated by the farmer group. And then the high resolution time of flight aerosol mass spectrometer, which analyzed between roughly 50 and 750 nanometers, um, which I operated when I was in the DiCarlo group at the time. At the athletic study, there were similar instruments, again, another scanning mobility particle sizer and a high resolution time of flight aerosol mass spectrometer, or just AMS for short. So since we're doing a deep dive into the quantification of organic aerosols, it's important to uh, provide a little bit of context for how we quantify aerosol species with the AMS. So this equation here shows how the concentration of a species of interest is proportional to the sum of all ion fragments of that species of interest. And the important quantification parameters um, are shown here. First is the nitrate ionization efficiency. Nitrate is our primary calibrant. All other species are quantified using a relative ionization efficiency or RIE, which is a scaling factor to the nitrate ionization efficiency. If you know the ionization efficiency of your species of interest and your nitrate ionization efficiency, you can easily calculate the RIE by the ratio um, along with their molecular weights. And these um, RIE values for ambient organic aerosol have been developed over the years through laboratory experiments and intercomparisons. Um, I have a few examples of the values used for ambient aerosol here. So for nitrate, we use 1.1, sulfate 1.2, ammonia somewhere around four, and for organic aerosol, 1.4. And it's important to mention that for organic aerosol, all ion fragments that are considered organic are quantified using a relative ionization efficiency of 1.4. And this has been shown to be really robust in uh, ambient studies. Uh, the next really important factor is the collection efficiency or the CE. So the collection efficiency accounts for particle bounce off the vaporizer. So um, this parameter was initially introduced when uh, intercomparisons showed that AMSs were pretty consistently measuring about half that of other uh, instruments. And so a collection efficiency of 0.5 was initially used um, to account for that bounce. However, liquid aerosols, um, specifically cooking organic aerosols, which are liquid, um, are assumed to have a collection efficiency of one because they will not bounce off of the thermal vaporizer and will be detected at higher efficiency. For ambient studies, a composition dependent parameterization has been introduced. Um, this parameterization uses the um, fraction of ammonium nitrate and sulfate as proxies for phase state. So with all of this in mind, it's important to note that uh, inner comparisons have indicated that the AMS is robust in ambient data sets within its approximately 35% uncertainty estimate. Um, another motivator for taking this deep dive on aerosol quantification was the uh, Murphy 2016 paper published in ASNT, um, which used a model to show that AMS quantification depends on molecular weight in ways that aren't currently being accounted for. And uh, it called for a deeper investigation of AMS quantification of organics. Um, however, this uh, comment published by Jimenez et al. in 2016 showed that experimental data does not corroborate those um, modeling results. So this figure here on the right shows the AMS relative ionization efficiency versus molecular weight with that Murphy prediction in the gray area. And you can see that most of the species tested fall within that range of 1.4 that are used for um, that is used to quantify ambient organic aerosols. 
Another important study that was published in 2018 showed that um, through laboratory experiments, the response factor or RIE is dependent on oxidation state. So this figure shows the relative ionization efficiency measured for various standards in the laboratory as a function of oxidation state. Um, with that gray area indicating the ambient organic aerosol RIE of 1.4. So you can see that for the species with lower oxidation states, the more chemically reduced species have a higher RIE than the ambient organic aerosol. And it's important to note that the hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol and cooking organic aerosol, those components of primary organic aerosol fall within the range um, of uh, oxidation states where we'd expect to see a higher RIE. Um, one important conclusion from this study is that even though some of these species do have a higher relative ionization efficiency, the value of 1.4 is still robust for ambient studies because of the large number of organic molecules present in aerosol particles and the averaging that takes place. Another really important laboratory study that was published showed that laboratory cooking organic aerosol has a higher RIE than ambient organic aerosol. And in this study, they found that the laboratory COA had an RIE of 1.56 to 3.06, which was comparable to laboratory oleic acid aerosols. So um, before diving into the results, um, I'm just going to summarize some of our motivation for taking this deep dive into quantification. So AMSs have been used outdoors for about 20 years, um, more than 20 years, and inner comparisons have indicated that it is accurate within uncertainty estimates. However, uh, recent work demonstrates the need for a more robust understanding and a testing of organic aerosol quantification with the AMSs. Um, additionally, increased focus on indoor chemistry has expanded traditional AMS applications. So uh, just as an example, right now the CASA campaign is happening, which is, um, I think of like the second part in the home chem story. And I saw on Twitter that they are cooking bacon at the CASA study and sampling the emissions with an AMS. So these results may still be relevant to somebody. Okay, so for some results, um, we found that at home chem and athletic, the AMS agreed within uncertainty estimates during outdoor and indoor baseline sampling. So here we have a histogram of the AMS to SMPS ratio for the two studies with the indoor baseline sampling in gray and the outdoor sampling in the dashed line. And you can see that most of the data is clustered around the one to one line, indicating good agreement. And for this data shown, the standard ambient quantification parameters that I described previously were applied. And to compare directly with the SMPS, which measures particle volume, the AMS mass was converted to volume using an oxygen to carbon and hydrogen to carbon density parameterization. However, uh, during indoor cooking, the AMS to SMPS ratio was much greater than one um, with those standard ambient quantification parameters applied. Um, again, this is just another inner comparison for outdoor data at home chem, and you can see that the AMS agrees well within uncertainty estimates for that outdoor sampling. So we have the AMS volume concentration on the y-axis in each panel, and then the concentration measured by four of the co-located instruments on the x-axis, uh, colored by the date of the sampling data point. And most of the slopes are right around one, um, with decent r-squareds indicating that uh, there's good agreement and those standard ambient quantification parameters um, work pretty well for um, outdoor data at least. So at home chem, we observed a discrepancy between the AMS and SMPS during cooking experiments. So this figure shows the volume concentration measured by both instruments as a function of time during a Thanksgiving experiment. So you can see the concentration is low in the morning, and then as soon as we start cooking, we see huge concentrations of organic aerosol. Um, there's different cooking activities that happen throughout the day. For example, this first spike was caused by breakfast cooking. We made pie and turkey and um, a bunch of other side dishes, and there was very, very high concentrations of aerosol throughout the day. At Athletic, um, a discrepancy was also observed between the AMS and SMPS when sampling cooking plumes. So the top panel of this figure shows the volume concentration measured, measured by the AMS in blue and by the SMPS in red. 
And you can see that during each of these cooking plumes, the AMS concentration is much higher than the SMPS concentration. In this bottom panel here, we have the AMS duct concentration minus the room concentration. And here in this example, you can see that the duct concentration increases first, indicating that the cooking organic aerosol was uh, brought to the sampling area by the HVAC ducts. Uh, we considered three major factors which could contribute to the discrepancy that we observed during the cooking experiments. Um, the first is imperfect size distribution overlap between instruments. The second is aerosol density. And the third is um, AMS response factor or the relative ionization efficiency and collection efficiency. Um, the RIE and CE are by far the most important parameters contributing to the discrepancy. Um, however, in order to accurately constrain those two, we need to first understand uh, the first two factors. So the first factor is size distribution overlap. So here we have the um, volume versus size distribution measured by AMS and SMPS during a home chem stir fry experiment. And you can see that the size distribution is shifted towards the larger size ranges and that the SMPS didn't quite capture all of that size distribution. Uh, luckily, we had the UHSAS, which had a wider size range, so we can use this instrument to compare to during those um, stir fry experiments and other experiments which had larger aerosol size distributions. During Thanksgiving experiments, the volume size distribution was shifted towards smaller aerodynamic diameters, and there was really nice overlap between the AMS and SMPS in the range where the AMS has a high transmission of aerosols. And during the athletic experiment, uh, again, we have the volume size distribution showing really nice agreement between the AMS and SMPS. So this data indicates that we can uh, compare quantitatively between the AMS and SMPS during experiments where we have size distribution overlap, and otherwise we can compare to the UHSAS. So the second factor is the density applied to the AMS data when converting to volume. And I mentioned earlier, we can use the AMS O to C and H to C density parameterization, as well as the size distribution overlap between the AMS and SMPS. So the AMS measures vacuum aerodynamic diameter and the SMPS measures the mobility diameter. And if there's good agreement between the two instruments, then the density assumed uh, can be one. And as I showed on the previous slide, we had really nice agreement between the two instruments and the um, O to C and H to C parameterization indicated that the density should be one. So we can go ahead and use a density of one for cooking organic aerosol uh, with confidence. So with all of those other factors considered, we can plot the AMS volume versus the co-located instrument volume concentration for the different um, athletic cooking plumes here at the top and a few different cooking experiments from home chem at the bottom. And you can see that even though the AMS is much higher than the other instruments, there is at least good correlation, which is comforting. We can use these slopes to calculate the relative ionization efficiency of the bulk cooking organic aerosol um, we just have to apply a few different scalars, which account for the mass to charge range analyzed, as well as the um, relative ionization efficiency already applied to the ambient organic aerosol. To summarize those results, we have the uh, response factor or the relative ionization efficiency times collection efficiency on the y-axis for the home chem and athletic studies here, as well as that laboratory cooking organic aerosol study I mentioned previously. And even though a pretty wide range of response factors were observed between these three studies, all of the studies together indicate that the cooking organic aerosol response factor is much greater than the ambient organic aerosol response factor, which is 1.4 times roughly 0.5 considering collection efficiency. Um, we also tested a number of laboratory aerosols, uh, including COA proxy molecules, um, and we got steer, uh, the relative ionization efficiencies for stearic acid, oleic acid, linoleic acid, and squalene. And this range of response factors observed for the laboratory aerosols uh, corroborates these high response factors observed in the field. 
And uh, something interesting to point out is that the Reyes uh, Viega study cooked with a cooking oil that was predominantly comprised of oleic acid, um, whereas at Home Chem, we used soybean oil, which was predominantly linoleic acid. So it's possible that cooking style and ingredients used can impact the response factor observed in the instrument. And just to summarize, averaging all of these uh, three studies together, we get a bulk uh, relative ionization efficiency of 4.2 compared to the response factor for outdoor uh, organic aerosol of 1.4. Um, okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the mass spectra. Uh, so this figure shows that the uh, characteristic COA ion ratios that I mentioned earlier were observed in the home chem and athletic aerosol mass spectra. So we have our home chem uh, mass spectrum here and our athletic mass spectrum here with each stick representing an ion fragment colored by its ion type. So green is our CH ions and pink are our CHO ions. And you can see that that characteristic 55 to 57 ratio is greater than one and that when we compare the two mass spectra, we get really nice agreement. Uh, we performed positive matrix factorization on the home chem cooking organic aerosol to try to resolve different factors of that bulk cooking organic aerosol. And we describe them as um, cooking organic aerosol 2, or COA2, which was predominantly observed during oven use. Cooking organic aerosol 1, which we observed during stovetop sauteing cooking associated hydrocarbon-like organic aerosol, or CHOA, which we saw uh, during bread toasting, whose mass spectrum resembles that of vehicle emissions, and cooking associated burning browning organic aerosol, or CBBOA, which is our oxidized factor, which spiked in concentration during different burning, charring, and caramelization events. So if you recall from the Shu et al. paper published in 2018 that the relative ionization efficiency is oxidation state dependent. Therefore, our uh, COA component response factors could also depend on oxidation state. So given that we have these three reduced factors here, uh, which could warrant the use of an RIE greater than 1.4, whereas our CBBOA factor uh, warrants an RIE of 1.4 based on the results of this laboratory study. So we attempted to quantify these PMF factors using two different results. Um, the first is this custom fit method in which we fit the AMS data to either the SMPS or UHSAS data. So we set the, um, for example, UHSAS volume equal to each AMS different um, composition divided by the response factor. And we asked the fitting algorithm to calculate the best response factor F for these reduced PMF factors. Uh, the second method, which is uh, the one that I showed previously, which is the bulk method, involves applying the same response factor to all of the organic PMF factors, regardless of their oxidation state. Shown here is the particle volume concentration during home chem stir fry experiments for each of the four PMF factors, and in gray, the UHSAS volume concentration. In this, fan in this panel, we used the custom fit method in which our reduced factors had a higher relative ionization efficiency. And in this panel, we used the bulk method in which all factors had the same response factor applied. When we plot the volume uh, of the AMS versus that of the UHSAS for the different methods, we see really great agreement for both. So using those elevated response factors on our reduced PMF factors shown here using the custom fit method, we see really nice agreement compared to the initial disagreement with the standard ambient quantification parameters applied. And this is data from a home chem Thanksgiving experiment. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about how PMF was able to resolve individual contributions to cooking organic aerosol uh, concentrations during home chem. So here um, we have the AMS mass concentration, which is now quantified as a function of time during a vegetarian stir fry experiment and a bread toasting experiment. And you can see that the concentration of COA1 here in green spikes when vegetables are sauteing in oil which is clearly a different spike from the uh, concentration of CBBOA, the oxidized factor 
which uh, spikes when the stir fry sauce was added to the pan. And then later on in the day when we toasted bread, we see a completely different PMF uh, factor spike, which was our cooking associated hydrocarbon like organic aerosol. Um, then this figure is showing the concentration of the cooking associated burning browning organic aerosol, the oxidized factor during a Thanksgiving experiment at home chem. And we can see here uh, the CBBOA concentration is in black. It spikes during various burning, charring, and caramelization events. So here are some two um, accidental burning events in which our CBBOA concentration went up. And we see that it follows the same temporal trend as the anhydrous sugar signal here shown in pink and the brown carbon signal shown here in the dashed line and the AMS mass 60 ion. So to summarize the results for indoor cooking organic aerosol, we found that uh, for the bulk COA, the average response factor was 4.2 considering these three studies um, compared to the value for ambient organic aerosol of 1.4. We performed positive matrix factorization of the cooking organic aerosol at home chem. We found that PMF was able to separate individual contributions to the total cooking organic aerosol. And then we went ahead and applied an elevated relative ionization efficiency to the home chem reduced PMF factors to see really nice agreement with the co-located instruments. So an important question to ask at this point is, um, do these results apply to ambient cooking organic aerosol? To try to get at, at answering this question, we reanalyzed two data sets, one from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 2016 by Avery et al. and one from Pasadena, California during the Calnex 2010 study um, by Hayes et al. And uh, so we're back outside and we're in this regime where the average COA concentration is about five to 20% of the total, no longer looking at uh, 80, per, 80 to 95% of the total aerosol concentration. And we found in the Philadelphia data set that the AMS to SMPS ratio increased with the increasing fraction of primary organic aerosol. So here's that outdoor data with the AMS to SMPS ratio on the Y axis and the fraction of primary organic aerosol on the x-axis. Um, for the two studies, we found that the inner comparison with the co-located instruments is best when the primary organic aerosol response factor is on the order of uh, 1.5 to 2. So this figure shows the Calnex data on the left and the Philadelphia data on the right. Um, the x-axis shows the PMF, res uh, sorry, the POA response factor applied and the y-axis are some of our intercomparison parameters like r-squared and slope. And for example, you can see that the r-squared is highest when the POA response factor is between about 1.5 and 2 for both data sets. Uh, this value is nowhere near as high as the relative ionization efficiency uh, that we found for fresh cooking organic aerosol indoors, but it is uh, significantly different from the relative ionization efficiency times collection efficiency for the ambient organic aerosol. Um, it's important to point out that quantification of the ambient POA is complicated by the low concentrations and atmospheric aging. Um, for example, if your POA fraction is about 20% of the total signal and you're off by a factor of four, um, the discrepancy would still be within the uncertainty estimates of the AMS technique. And until that primary organic aerosol fraction is about 50%, um, it's possible that a discrepancy wouldn't be noticed or um, wouldn't you know, be able to be detected. So to summarize the outdoor response factor, we found that for the Philadelphia 2016 and Calnex 2010 data, the response factor for primary organic aerosol was about 1.5 to 2. Um, we believe that oxidation of ambient cooking organic aerosol could reduce the response factor relative to fresh indoor cooking organic aerosol, which again, we saw a response factor on the order of four. And uh, with these results, we do encourage AMS users to consider evaluating an elevated response factor for PMF derived cooking organic aerosol and or uh, primary organic aerosol, especially if they're close to a strong source. So since publishing this study, um, two uh, papers have cited us and attempted to apply our elevated response factor. So have these other ambient studies observed a similar effect in their data sets? 
Uh, this first study published by Chen et al. in 2021 found a cooking organic aerosol factor in their data set that was about 8% of the total PM2.5. And this figure from that paper on the right shows the cooking organic aerosol concentration as a diurnal plot with a few different cooking organic aerosol tracer species, such as these um, fatty acids, oleic acids, stearic acid, et cetera. The authors tested a response factor range between 0.4 and 5 for their uh, PMF-derived cooking organic aerosol. However, they did not observe an improved correlation between the AMS and SMPS. Um, and did not end up applying a higher response factor. Um, the second study that um, looked at the elevated response factor used paired AMS and gas chromatography measurements um, called TAG, and they observed both a primary and an oxygenated uh, COA factor in their data set using positive matrix factorization of AMS and molecular marker PMF data um, using that TAG data. And this figure just shows some really nice agreement between the AMS PMF factors and the uh, tag tracer species that they observed. Um, and again, they also observed a small concentration of COA in their total mass concentration and also did not um, apply an elevated response factor. To conclude, we observed an indoor uh, RIE of 4.2 for fresh cooking organic aerosol, and we considered results from the home chem and athletic field campaigns as well as, well as this laboratory cooking organic aerosol study. Um, we found that outdoors um, elevated POA response factor of about 1.5 to 2 improved agreement between um, the AMS and co-located instruments. However, um, outdoor COA aging and dilution can complicate the quantification, and we just emphasize the need for um, careful quantification and intercomparisons, especially for near source organic aerosol studies. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions now, and if you'd like, you can um, contact me with any questions here and uh, follow me on Twitter. Um, again, the chat's open for any questions, or if you want to hop on and unmute, you can go ahead and ask Aaron directly. Okay, so a question in the chat, has this changed how you think about cooking in your house? Um, I definitely use my ventilation uh, fan as often as I can. And if I'm, if I'm cooking at somebody else's uh, house, I definitely encourage them to do that too or open a window. I do even have a purple air sensor, um, which tells me when I have really exceeded um, some hazardous levels. So um yeah i think that just working on the home chem campaign and indoor chem in general has uh, made me think a lot about indoor sources and trying to mitigate them when i cook indoors um okay the question also is is there a circumstance where um dilution can improve quantification like does direct potency negatively affect the instrument um so i think that the dilution or like at least from what I understand is it makes it just a little bit more difficult to quantify it. So if you're right next to the source and it's 80% of the total signal you're observing, it's really easy to see a discrepancy. Um, however, if it's pretty dilute and it's only, you know, eight to 20% of the total concentration, I think it can be just difficult to tell if your COA is what's causing the discrepancy or if it's something else. So I'm not sure if, um, dilution necessarily improves quantification i think it just makes it a little harder if that makes sense um 
And then uh, thanks, Ellis. Can you talk about what makes cooking OA special in the AMS on a molecular level? Like why do these compounds seem to behave so differently from the mo from most of the rest? Um, that's a great question. I think that um, because the COA is more reduced, um, it's been described previously that these more reduced components have a um, greater ionization cross-section, which makes them easier to be ionized um, compared to the oxidized organic aerosol components. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, is there a difference between types of stoves, gas versus electric, or is most of the aerosol from the food? So at home chem, we did do a few experiments where we would cook the stir fry on a gas stove and then also on a hot plate. Um, I can't specifically remember uh, what if we got any solid conclusions about if the gas versus electric um, changed the total magnitude of the concentration. I think that individual cooking styles seemed to be more of an indicator of how much aerosol was going to be emitted compared to the type of heat source. But if anybody from Home Chem who worked on that stuff is here and wants to comment on that, that'd be that'd be great. But I don't think we saw much of a difference between the stove types, at least for the organic aerosol concentrations. Um, definitely for like NOx levels though. Um, ben, thanks. Ben asks, what do you think is the molecular mechanism causing the decreased detection? So that's, uh, yeah, I guess I mentioned that briefly. That's, I think, the difference in ionization cross-section um, for those um, reduced versus oxidized species. Um, the question I want to ask that the aerosol that is measured during cooking is only due to cooking food or due to gas source used for cooking. So. Um, at least from the home chem study, I think that most of the aerosol was from cooking. I think we saw a small fraction of our aerosol attributed to the gas stove, but it was maybe like 5% or less. Another question, the athletic study is essentially slightly aged COA. Does athletic centerized location have any relevance to this study? Um, so I'm not sure exactly how aged it was. We think that the emissions happened either right outside of the gym and were brought indoors or from a um, different area within the building. So this study happened right during a, I think, like football game weekend. So there was like barbecuing outside and that came inside. Um, so I'm not sure if it's slightly aged, maybe more slightly than home chem since it wasn't emitted right there in the same room. Um, and then the athletic center as the location have any relevance to the study. So the they weren't looking for cooking organic aerosol. This wasn't the point of the athletic study, which was kind of interesting. It just sort of came in and we found these interesting observations. Um, most of the relevant details for it being in an athletic center were sampling human emissions and they looked at some um, emissions from cleaning. So those those studies are published from the athletic study and they're really great. Uh, during home chem, do you see any cooking with the kitchen hood on? We, oh, I, I should have mentioned this. This is a good question. We actually did not do any control strategies at home chem. Um, so we didn't use the ventilation. We just were looking to sample the emissions without any modifications. And then, um, thank you, Anne. Um, Yes, Anne is mentioning that she would like other folks to make sure they clearly have calibrated the other instrumentation to make sure they don't lump all the potential issues together. Um, this is a really, really good point. And we were lucky at Home Chem to have so many um, instruments together to compare with. And then can I link the ASNT paper in the chat? Yeah, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and get, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if nobody else is going to say something, I will. Uh, this is Doug Warstop. Look, to add two things to what you said, by the way, that, that was really good. Thanks. To add two things, you should also mention that they, they, when you say it's more reduced compounds, but, uh, to be slightly more preci precise, these are already heat treated compounds, and which means that there's less decomposition in the AMS heating. 
comparatively. And you should also mention that we think, many people think the CE, the collection efficiency is also larger because they're more liquid-like and more oily. But yeah. the one question I have, that, I mean, after you've done all this, if you looked at the literature, and now I'm specifically talking about China and to a lesser degree, Paris, where um, the cooking aerosol is um, larger than most places. In Beijing in particular, it's because you can't go anywhere in Beijing and not be near a restaurant and actually get direct local emissions. And the bottom line question is based on this, do you have an opinion or does anybody have an opinion on whether we're overestimating how, how much, it may be better, how much are we overestimating cooking aerosol in a city like Beijing and the other big winner in terms of cooking aerosol is Paris? Um, yeah, I, I like, I'm not really sure. Um, I guess if we think about the, you know, the other ambient studies that we looked at for this study, um, you know, it could just be a factor of like one and a half or two, but um, it would probably be a lot easier to tell if there was um, a much higher concentration. I think that, you know, people doing studies there should definitely look into it. Um, I haven't been like so up to date um, with like the most recent AMS studies there. So if anyone else wants to comment on that, I would like love to hear what they're working on. I'm, I'm really not sure. I'd be really interested to see. Doug, can I ask, this is uh, Brian McDonald here. Can I ask a follow-up question to your question? Has anyone looked at the cooking organic aerosol, say from like airborne measurements that go over urban areas? And does that kind of get to this you're saying there's potentially a sampling bias of just being very near cooking sources wherever you are in a city, right? Are they different? Um, so you're asking like if there'd be a difference between um, our observations from an aircraft versus like on the ground really close to the restaurants, essentially? Right, once there's been some atmospheric dilution and mixing going on. Yeah, that's a good question. I would assume that um, based on these like lab studies and stuff that we've seen that um, once the um, aerosol has been aged, it might have uh, a relative ionization efficiency closer to 1.4. Um, I guess we're not really, I'm not personally so familiar with everything that will happen with COA once it's outside. So um, those aircraft studies could definitely try to look into those kinds of things. I think that being close to the restaurants makes it definitely easier to, you know, figure out and like pull out that discrepancy. Um, I don't know if it is just greater because you're close to it because it's fresher. Um, but yeah, that's definitely a, a really, really good question. I think people should look at in the future. Hey, Aaron, this is Ben Nolte. Um, during Chorus AQ, when we were flying over Seoul, we did not see any cooking aerosol whatsoever when we ran the PMF, but um, the ground-based instruments were able to see cooking aerosol. So even when we were flying just 100, 200 meters above the ground, by that point, it had gotten so diluted or aged or whatever other process happened that it could not be distinguished. So it looks like you have to be really close to the source for it to be distinguishable. Cool. That's that makes total sense. Thank you so much for sharing that. We we should recommend those those such aircraft measurements have not been made in China, and actually that's a really good idea to um, try to make that happen. Okay, there's another question too. Um, in practical, could there be several indoor sources? Oh, there there could be several indoor sources of organic aerosol during winter. Other sources such as wood stove fireplace burning may influence the results. How could you distinguish between cooking and biomass uh, burning sources? So um, we did, I mean, sorry, right, I'll go back a couple of slides here. Um, so for example, with our PMF of the cooking data at home chem, we did pull out a factor that described all of the different burning events. And that uh, factor is described by this mass spectrum here and the study we call it cooking associated burning browning organic aerosol. And we did see it um, spike very distinctly during accidental burning events. One of these plumes was from the burning of an oven mitt. 
And so we were able to differentiate that between, um, for example, like stovetop sauteing. So PMF is a pretty cool and powerful tool. So I think that, um, yeah, you could you could distinguish between cooking and the biomass burning sources probably. Okay, Ellis is asking about potential issues with quantifying fresh non-cooking primary organic aerosol. Can I talk about how much I think these issues are pertinent when we think about quantifying non-cooking POA of the AMS? How similar or different are the ionization cross sections, thermal stability issues? That's a really, really good question. And I think that um, I'm not aware of studies that have looked directly at uh, other primary non-cooking sources and attempted to get response factors for them based on um, just the laboratory stuff and the um, differences between RIE and oxidation state, maybe we'd um, expect to see it. Also, there's some comments in the chat about um, thermal stability and those compounds with um, that are very thermally stable um, could have higher RIEs. So it's possible that there is an, uh, an effect, but I think the community could probably benefit um, from looking at, you know, response factors from like just straight up like vehicle emissions or something like that. I'm not sure if anybody has looked into that or is planning to, but I think that'd be really cool. Okay, Ben said this is something we're trying to look at at Aerodyne right now. That's cool. that conclusion slide. Um, question is, did you find any other potential markers for fresh COA during your studies? Um, honestly, I haven't done too deep of a dive into the PMF of COA. I did start, I started grad school so shortly after collecting this data. So I haven't like, there's still a lot to explore in it that I haven't looked at. Um, but uh, there's I personally haven't, but I know that a lot of other studies have looked at potential markers for fresh COA besides um, that like mass 55 to 57 ratio that I've been mentioning. I know there's some like specific um, ions that people look at. Um, I think that this study would even uh, be a good reference to check that out because they um, compare different types of COA factors in their data set. And then, um, do you expect there would be difference in OA aging behavior by different COA factors? Can one factor be more sensitive to atmospheric aging? Um, yeah, potentially. Um, yeah, I guess it depends, I suppose, on like, if there's a lot of double bonds, maybe those would be more sensitive to certain types of oxidation versus others. Um, so I, I could imagine that certain different factors could be more or less sensitive, but I'm not 100% sure. Thank you. I say that there we go. <laughs> Let's 
sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, Anne is mentioning RAE nitrate 1.05 and lens transmission should not be added to AMS mass distribution. It should reduce other measurements. That's a good point. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me and hosting. This was great. <laughs> He just does the coordinating and I just get to be along for the ride here. Well, um, thank you everyone for joining us, Erin. That was an awesome talk. Uh, thank you, um, Ryan, for hosting. And uh, thank you all for the wonderful uh, discussion following it too. Um, this was a really great lecture and I hope to see you all next month. Thanks everyone. Cool, thank you.